part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Don Mike Mendoza, your host for Producing While Asian, and welcome to Season 2 of our podcast. Today's episode is a very exciting one as it is a small group discussion with two wonderful, wonderful Broadway actors and producers, Aaron Albano and Telly Leung, uh, both known for their many roles on Broadway and now for their production role in the documentary called Ensemble. We're going to talk a little bit about their collective professional history and how they got to where they are today, but mostly about the film and how Ensemble came to be. So without any further ado, welcome to season two and our conversation on Producing While Asian with Aaron Albano and Telly Leon. Hey everybody, this is Don Mike and I'm here with the amazing Aaron Albano and Telly Leung and we're here to talk about Ensemble um, and also a little bit about these two beautiful handsome men as people in the arts. So hi guys, how are you? Hi. Hi, good to be with you, Don. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's it's so good to have you guys. I, you know, admire both of your work and it's like surreal to me that I'm in a room with both of you right now talking about a project you guys are working on. So we'll hop right into it. So for our listeners that don't necessarily know a lot about both of you guys, they know, you know, what's in your bios. Tell us a little bit about kind of, you know, where you came from, how you got into your careers and, you know, what led you to producing Ensemble. Anybody can start. Well, I'll start. My name is Telly Leung. I'm a Broadway actor. Over the last 20 years, I've done seven Broadway shows as a performer. But in the last couple of years, I've started doing a lot more teaching in in universities and some private coaching and teaching. I've done a little bit of directing and I've done a bit of producing as well. And when the pandemic sort of started, I did a lot more of all of those things only because all of the avenues for, for live performance sort of shut down on all of us. So I was thrilled to get a phone call from my dear friend, Aaron Albano, who was my castmate in Allegiance on Broadway. But we've also known each other for almost two decades as well, because one of his very first jobs was in a production of Miss Saigon that we did together at the Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera. And really, it was Aaron who came to me with this idea. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if it weren't for Telly, this would not have happened. This is my first sort of venture into producing. Before this, I've been Broadway performer, Broadway actor for, oh goodness, since 2004. And I've done nine Broadway shows in various positions in those shows, some as principals, some as ensemble members, some as swings, but none of them sort of on this side of the table. And this, over the pandemic, I... Myself and my friend Mo Brady, who is also a former performer, former performer, but since has transitioned into working for a lot of non-charity as well, non-charity, not-for-profit charity work, as well as founded and hosted the podcast, The Ensemblist, for a very long time. We were working a lot during the pandemic because when you can't do theater, you just talk about theater a lot. We had this idea that sort of ended up being this film where we wanted to gather 13 ensemble members of Broadway performers to sort of talk about the business because that hadn't happened in an age. And we thought that it was sort of ripe, a good time to, a long overdue time to have that happen. We had a little bit of struggle getting it off the ground. My wonderful friend, Tully Leung, was able to, I, I called him, not even to like jump on the project, but just sort of for advice. And luckily he really connected to the idea so much that he was like, Hey, I want to help you do this. Let me jump on board too. And then it sort of took off for the races. It was great. It also starts Aaron with a fantastic idea. You and Mo came up with this wonderful concept and really not since a chorus line on Broadway, have we really had a piece that was about the ensemble, about the hardworking blue collar workers of Broadway. Now, the chorus line was in the seventies. Now we're talking about, mm-hmm. now we're in a whole different time where we're yeah. in a time of great, you know, social change, racial reckoning. There's a pandemic that's gone on that sort of laid bare a lot of the things that in out that were structurally not always the best about Broadway. So it was long, like Aaron said, a long overdue time to have this conversation. And what ended up happening was Aaron actually had, I think a different producer that was attached to this. And he called me saying, Telly, as a friend, I need some advice. Like we, we just lost this other person who was going to produce this 
this documentary for us, this evening for us. I don't know what to do. Like, we really want to do this in March of 2021 to signify that it is the one year anniversary of the Broadway shutdown that happened in March of 2020, an unprecedented shutdown for our industry that 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 halted everything, that halted not just our industry, but the world and said, we mm -hmm. really want to capture this, but we don't know how to do it now that we've lost funding and we've lost support. And I said, wait a minute, Aaron, how how much funding do you need? What kind of support do you need? And as we got down to the real nuts and bolts of what he needed, my producing partner and I, Joey Monda, who was also an associate producer on Allegiance, we said, listen, why don't we, why don't we try to find a way to make this happen? That's awesome. And, you know, because of that kind of pause in our industry and the whole shutdown and all of us losing our collective jobs, like overnight, you know, I would say that's where this podcast came from. You know, this was a chance to kind of be part of that conversation and to show that there are people like me, like the two of you that are AAPI that produce because like I, the motivation to have this conversation and start this whole thing is that, you know, people couldn't find us for some reason, like, and let alone in at the actor circles, but then in the production circles, you know, like they don't, they don't know where to look for us. So I'm thrilled that you're both here to talk about that, but that's an amazing story. And it it's relevant, you know, watching it, it's kind of like, I'm watching it from the producer theater point of view, but, you know, trying to think of it from somebody who's not part of our industry, just the people like, oh, well, what happened to the singers and the dancers and all that stuff? You know, it was a really good view into how hard it was and like what that looked like, how it affected people and kind of the choices that folks made in that pause, which were all, you know, all across the spectrum, you know, it's neither good nor bad, it's all of it. So given kind of your path into producing this piece, you know, you gave a little bit about it in your individual histories, but we ask every guest this question and it's, you know, on a scale of one to producer, meaning I'm totally a producer, it's I eat, sleep and breathe it, or I'm not at all. Like, you know, what you said to me before the interview, Aaron, give me a script and a costume and I'm good. Tell us a little bit about where you fall on that scale, because nowadays, you know, we kind of move through this industry as almost like a one man band in most cases where you mm. produce your own work, you, you know, look for support you look for people you know so tell me a little bit where you guys would define yourself and it doesn't have to be forever you know it'll it can change but where do you sit in, the, in that scale oh for sure i definitely this is my first venture and it's definitely i've i've spoken to telly many a time where i'm like i feel like i'm getting a glimpse into how you've been living for the past two five ten years and Wow, <laughs> it's a lot. And so on a scale of one to producer, I do feel like I'm sort of quickly going from like the negative side to the positive side, but in the very low end of it, I don't know where I am and I, where I will be beyond this, but I've already, I've already felt my sort of brain changing and thinking about things in a different way. Oh my goodness. And, and one of the biggest subjects in our film is sort of the inaccessibility and lack of information about producer about producing to the other sort of categories in the industry and i've been here for 18 years now and i didn't i've learned so much in the past one or two years that i would have no idea where to start thank goodness for telly and joey that like were able to sort of walk me through this and just through their sort of tutelage and their sort of mentorship, I've definitely feel like I've been, I've gotten an education, experiential education in producing. Again, I know there's a, there's so much more to learn, but even just like this dipping of my toe into producing, I definitely feel like I pretend like I hate it, but I hate that I don't hate it as much as I pretend to if that makes sense. Yeah, so I absolutely. would say like one to two scarily walking towards the three, four, five range more quickly than I want to. That's great. For me, I, 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 in this moment, I can actually call myself a producer with a capital P now. So I definitely feel like I'm on that side of the scale now. And it's interesting. I think at the end of the day, Aaron and I are multi-hyphenate artists and we came into this industry via performing and when we were studying musical theater in college i went to carnegie mellon aaron went to cincinnati Con conservatory of music there is there is a great divide between the art 
and the commerce of it. When you're studying mm-hmm. at a conservatory like that, you are studying the craft and the art. Your first couple of years, they don't even teach you how to get a job. They don't teach you about the actual mechanics of the business of show. And then all of a sudden, your senior year, they sort of give you a crash course in what it is and to be a working actor, how to market yourself, all of those business skills that I wish I had from day one. Because I think, But I think in a way, those conservatories are trying to keep the purity of the training and of the craft away from sort of the, the commerce part, right? But I... I it's interesting. I, I feel like I've always done that. You know, I have friends from college who, who, when I tell them I'm producing projects now and ensemble is sort of the third or fourth thing where I'm actually officially labeled a producer on something, they reminded me, they said, Telly, do you realize that you've always been, been producing? I went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Back when I was in school, the school paid for your New York showcase. They did not pay for your Los Angeles showcase. And at the time, back in 2002, I did the math. It cost each person $900 to go to showcase. We had kids in our class that simply couldn't afford to do that. That included the plane ticket, the hotel room, the rental of the space for us to do the actual showcase for five days. Well, I was the one that sort of figured out how to raise all of that money so that all of my classmates could go. I didn't think of myself as a producer. I certainly didn't make any money doing it, but I understood what was important was how do we get these amazing people together that are in my class, some of the most talented musical theater performers and theater artists I know, to then start raising money. We made a Christmas album in a black box theater because it was soundproof and we sold it at shows. I basically pimped out all of my musical theater majors and I put together reviews and I, you know, I booked them into jazz clubs all over New York City and Pittsburgh to sing for their supper. And we were able to raise all of that money for all 30 plus people in my class to be able to go and not pay a dime to do it. And my classmates were like, by the way, did you know you were producing then? I didn't. I just wanted to raise money so that the, my, my friends yeah. could go to showcase. <laughs> it was the same thing. I even, I even think about ensemble that way. You know, when, when Aaron said, do you want to produce ensemble? There was nothing in my brain that said, let's make something that we're going to, you know, make a million dollars off one day. It was really about, sure. oh, this story is important. It's important to my friend Aaron. I respect Aaron as an artist. How do we make it happen? And we'll figure out sort of the, the commerce part of it later, but let's make sure that we make the art happen. And I also think that it's interesting. I think because we were groomed as performers, there's something a little dirty about being a producer, a little bit like, nah, ha, ha, those are the producers sitting up there yeah. raking in all the money. Right. And, and at the end, and I think that's part of the change that's happening that we talk about in our film, that why, why does that exist? Why can't Aaron Albano and I be producers? Why can't producers be also transparent and also talk about what it is that they're doing. Why is it a shroud, in a shroud of mystery what it is that what we do? So for us, I feel like the way that we've produced this film, we are trying to to be as accessible and as transparent as possible about how we're making it as well. Absolutely, and you know, and that's why we're having this conversation because we're also trying to battle that assumption that producers are exactly what you described like the fat cats who make all the money and they're like here actor mm-hmm. has zero dollars you know or have two dollars of the two million dollars that they make from whatever it is they make so you know that producers are everywhere and so to hear both of your perspectives on that is great because there is no definition really of producer and then you go into each industry like a music producer is different from a theater producer is different yeah. from you know it's a, a person who organizes a company you know so but we all do it right it's essentially if you boil it down it's being an organizer it's being the people person and making sure that you can bring people together which is the the point of it but a lot of people don't know that so and there is no production and well production but there's no producer major at most universities, especially because of the reason telly that you mentioned, where it's like, maybe they want to keep it purist and be like, if you're a performer, yeah. you're a performer, you don't know the other side, but the industry is changing in the sense that we have to know it. We have to know all parts of it because, you know, especially with people like us, some of the times we find our success in creating our own opportunities because we have to fight against gatekeepers. So, you know, to have the knowledge of people like the three of us and others, that can go beyond those gatekeepers or be the new kind of people that provide opportunities to folks that that are looking for it, you know, that's why we're here. So um, thank you for answering that question. Hey, I'm Jason. And I'm Gary. And And we we love ball ball cards. And if you love ball cards too, good news. You just found your new favorite podcast. 
From breaks to grading. And from collecting to flipping, join us on the Ball Card Show. The sports podcast for the sports collector. Hi, this is Telly Leung. Hi, this is Aaron Albano, and this is Producing While Asian. Focusing on the film a little more, what's the biggest lesson you two learned, you know, individually or collectively from this experience? I had never produced a documentary before. So this was a crash course in documentary producing by doing. I certainly did not go to film school. I didn't learn how to do it. I didn't learn how to finance it, any of that. But I will say the biggest sort of artistic lesson I learned about making a documentary is that you don't know what you're going to get. You know, unlike, mm. a script, unlike a scripted movie or a musical where we have the script to go by, well, we had no idea what those 13 dancers were going to say when we gathered them in right. a circle that night. We had no idea if it was going to be an emotionally raw conversation. We had no idea where how people were going to feel. We had no idea if they were going to say things that were very politically charged, because once again, this was March of 2021. This is post George Floyd, which was the summer of 2020. I mean, this was post, uh, you know, uh, an election that was very heated and contested. <laughs> yeah. And this was post yeah. January 6th. So uh, we had sort of no idea what the conversation was going to be. And as somebody who is a theater artist, I and I and I like sc the script and I respect the author. Well, there was no script here, so oh, good luck. Sure. Just turn the cameras on and see what happens. And I remember, I think all five of us, all four producers and our director, all had like different days where we sort of stressed out about it. We were like, "What if they don't do? It? What if they fight? What if nothing? No, nobody says anything? What if?" And all of us took sort of turns calming each other down being like, then that's what the movie is. Then that's what it is. And it's fine. And we'll do something and it'll be great. And it'll be what we wanted to make. And that was, yeah, I would agree that that was definitely a stressor at the time. And then it ended up being sort of one of the greatest freedoms. Is that the right word that we, that we found for, because then the, the words were the words. And then we had to sort of like represent our friends, our company, our cast as best as we could while telling a story and crafting a story that we all felt proud of. And that it, was that was my definitely a learning on the learning curve for me. It's freeing because the truth ends up being the litmus test for the mm, whole thing. Yes. Authenticity. Authenticity ends up being and with a documentary, that's all you want. You don't this isn't reality TV. We're not this isn't the Jersey Shore where we're trying to get Snooky and yeah. DJ Mike D to like have a moment. This is real. Mm -hmm. And so really at the end of the day, we said, what if something did something, this has to feel authentic. We have to make sure that we've created an environment where these 13 people can have authentic conversations where they can forget the cameras are on. And that's when we're going to get really good stuff. The same thing with the edit. You know, we wanted to, of course, we boiled down almost seven hours of footage between right. the footage that we got that night and and the and the performers at home footage that they took by themselves and testimonials that they had themselves boiling that down in, and not making sure that we didn't craft it in a way where we were mincing their words or changing the context but really capturing the essence of what they were saying mm -hmm. i think was really important to us so in some ways i think aaron is right the, the truth became our script in some yeah. ways yeah because i was gonna I think, say you probably oh. and sorry ended up with like the opposite problem where you had like way too much <laughs> to pull together because everyone is just, you know, I, I don't want to use the word excited because the pandemic is not exciting, but, you know, but really motivated to talk about their story because it's so important, you know, so I, that's great. Seven hours, it's crazy. But also the ensemble <laughs> members are, are motivated to talk about their story because how often are they asked? They're not asked yeah. for their stories. Right. You know, Broadway ensemble members, you know, audiences marvel eight times a week at what they do with their bodies. Nobody turns the camera on them and goes, what do you think about our industry, mm -hmm. about our world, about your profession? So it's, I think, I think again, we had 13 sort of, and I think Mo and Aaron did an amazing job curating those 13 people and, you know, at finding the right mix of people to come in, whether it's, there's gender diversity, there is racial diversity, the, you know, age diversity. But really, I, th I think those dancers understood, wow, this is a rare opportunity for, for me to get to speak my mind. And I think Aaron, one of the things that I learned most as, because this was the this was when I needed to sort of 
sort of straddle the line. I was a, both a producer and a participant in the film. If you see the film, you'll, I'm one of the 13. And so that was having that knowledge of like, okay, I know what we're trying to do, that sort of privileged knowledge, but also still be as authentic as I can be. Because if I'm the one sort of manipulated one in the, in the room with 12 completely honest people, that reads as well. So I think I did my best to sort of compartmentalize that and still speak my truth and speak the truth that I know from the industry, from a company perspective, from an ensemblist perspective. And Telly's absolutely right. It's one of those things that's like, we don't get asked. And sometimes arguably, and I might, this might be a biased opinion. We're the ones that have been there for <laughs> like, for show upon show upon show. We know what works in a, in a story structure of a show. We know what works on a stage to get people excited. We know how to, how to focus, like how to direct the focus of a moment into where it needs to be. And those are just the craft things. Like just when you get 13 people in a room who want to talk about the business part of show business, what they do know and what they don't, you're going to get fireworks. And it's, and that was a really exciting moment to use the word that we, you're right. A pandemic is not exciting, but that was a very exciting aspect of the night to which we then turned to our director at the end of the seven hours and we're like, um, here we go. Good luck. Good, good luck editing this. <laughs> Enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. So given that, you know, that experience, you know, without giving too much away to the audience before they see it, was there a story or, or certain stories that you a didn't expect to hear in the in the seven hours and b that moved you in a way that you didn't think it would you know in that time you know and and do and will they see that story in the, the documentary i would say i think like telly said a little bit ago the su most surprising thing of the night was the fact that we didn't know what was going to come out and i remember before we started we turned to each other and were and and said like do we need tissues? Because we got, we got the wine, we got the headshots, we got the glasses, we got the alcohol was taken care of. But we were like, wait, do we need tissues? Do we need, what do we need? Like, we don't know how this is going to go. And I think we did just assume because it had been a year, because we hadn't seen each other in ages, because we hadn't danced together, because all of these things sort of lined up to that we thought it would be safe to assume that it would be kind of an emotional night. We did not take into account sort of the headspace of the, of the current climate at the time of March, 2021. We could do like all of these things where it led to a much more cerebral night that I think you will definitely see in the film, which it, it sort of balances in the film. We have a lot of footage from the night itself, but then we also had the, participants sort of do at home confessionals for lack of a better term prior to the night as well as uh, after the night and though that sort of provided the sort of balance of emotion plus the heady 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 talk we ended up getting into which I think for me that was the most surprising part of the night sort of overall was that like oh we got into it we got into like the nooks and crannies of the industry where I thought we were going to be like, oh, I miss dancing, boo-hoo, 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 wasn't the case. And Telly, how about you? Well, I think this, to piggyback on what Aaron said, I think the biggest surprise for me was we had Broadway dancers in a room, Broadway ensemble members who proudly wear that label when the world was still <laughs> turning in 2019 and the industry was still going. And I was actually surprised by how quickly they talked about all the things that they couldn't do while the industry was going full force at 100 at 100 miles an hour right so there were people that felt like they never got a chance to say hi to their families or start a family or be with their kids or whatever that was like i just thought it was interesting that in the emptiness and the void of our industry that we as human beings and we as citizens of the world were able to find those other things that we couldn't do 
because we were so busy singing and dancing. You know, some <laughs> I know, I know we, we have several, several of our ensemble members who, who have always had and who are always activists at heart. Well, they were, they are very much now activists in life because they yeah. had that space and that time in order to do that. People that wanted to be parents, well, this was their opportunity to be a parent, you know, so and start a family. And some, something that probably some of these people might have pushed off because they were like, well, I'll do it after this show is over. And then maybe they get another show, right? So yeah. I think that part of it actually really surprised me. We were here to talk about dance and talk about Broadway and talk about what it is to be a Broadway performer. And because of where we were in the pandemic, so many people talked about their lives outside of that. And, yeah. and especially with that, along that line, I think what also surprised me the most was how sort of applicable our film sort of became in the current corporate climate of our country and our world. It was the aspect of, we had these members of our industry that were very revered, talking about how they've had to put as other aspects of their life in the, in a, in the back seat to prioritize their work, to prioritize their jobs to prioritize sort of their careers and seeing sort of the regret because that career had disappeared in March of 2021, seeing sort of the regret of, I didn't get to see like the weddings that I've missed, the children that I had, that I didn't get to have until this moment, like all of those things that I feel really are echoed in the work American workforce on mass. It's not, it's not unique to our industry, but I think that's one thing that's really strong that I did not expect that I think viewers of our film will really resonate with. And that's that was a very surprising sort of aspect of our film as well. Yeah, because you really think about it, it's certain, sure there are other people in other industries that didn't necessarily like lose their job, but they lost their office environment. They lost their daily routine. You know, they became confined to their homes, you know, relationships changed or started or you know like we were saying children you know were born in that time and people were able to do things that they wouldn't normally be able to do in that time period and so i think it was really neat to see in the film what the ensemble members feel for lack of a better phrase filled their time with in mm -hmm. that time and kind of what inspired them to to live through this time period and and what they focused on outside of work or what work and i think was. it's it, it it also harkens back to the idea that the last the last sort of image that our culture has of the actor and performer experience is 50 years old at the time what was purported and now is sort of revered as that experience is that we do this we do this and we do this only. This is the most important thing in our lives and it has to be or else you won't succeed. And that's what we're discovering is that not even just in our industry, but in all industries, even, even, the, even the industries that are not sort of artistically led, but still are the passion of the workforce, it can't be everything because the second it disappears, you have nothing. <laughs> And that's and 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 that and that's sort of I think a mindset that is challenged by our film. Well, I think also you know it's interesting. We are artists, so and we love our work, and we define ourselves by our work. And the lines between work and play and our passion are so blurry. But mm -hmm. now the pandemic has made everybody ask: Do you live to work or do you work to live? Mm. You know, and I think that that's right. that's actually the question that gets raised a lot in our film. And I think it. I think people watching it will be forced to ask that of themselves as well. Absolutely. And and I know there's the phrase that's going around in media right now that's saying this whole period is like the great resignation. Like, I feel like it's less that and more kind of like, and this sounds very like self-help book, but like great exploration, so to speak, because people were able to explore other sides of themselves. And sure, a byproduct of that is some people change their career path or their jobs or whatever, but it wouldn't have happened if they didn't have this time to explore what else they were capable of and kind of go outside of the, the box that defined them. And I think, you know, the cast members in this film were able to show that and show how, what else, what other parts of them existed, 
you know, in addition to being a Broadway dancer, dancer, ensemble member, actor, um, artist, kind of what exists, what else exists within them and what else are they capable of? And I think uh, the documentary does a great job of presenting that because it's that whole idea of like actors are people too. And so like you see, you know, who they are as people and, you know, there's a lot of people that surprisingly don't think that, which is, you know, shouldn't mm -hmm. be a surprise because it's, it's media. You see people on a stage or in a TV box and you're like, ah, it's, you know, they don't have feelings like they do. And so. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. Here's how Books with Brooks works. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Classics like Stephen King's The Shining, debut novels like We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lang, and tons of other compelling, life-changing stories, one book and one month at a time. So come read along with us and then listen in. Hey everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Hi, this is Telly Leung. Hi, this is Aaron Albano, and this is Producing While Asian. So given that, you know, I know we have a little bit of time left. So we usually have our guests talk a little bit about kind of advice they'd like to pay forward. Um, specifically, you know, obviously we're called Producing While Asian. So for any API people that are looking to jump in our, into our industry, but keeping it relevant to the documentary, you know, what kind of directional advice would you give to somebody who's watching that film and either hasn't entered the industry or somebody who is also in industry but hasn't had a chance to tell their story or somebody who might be wanting to change their track in all of this you know what kind of friendly advice would you give to them well don first of all i have to thank you for sharing the story of how this film was made and i think that is part of my advice to people as they watch the film i hope they understand that this film came about because all of these people that lacked work and lacked a job during the emptiness of this pandemic just called each other and made something. Mm. And we're able to like all pull together our resources to make it happen. We, we I mean, uh, you know, this, this was not a, a huge budget documentary at all. And frankly, it, it, you know, we called in, we called in some of our friends, some of our investor friends who had invested in Broadway shows who actually we knew financially did all right during the pandemic. They still had their jobs and they believed in the project. Not only did they believe in the project, but they believed in us and they believed in these stories being shared. Right. And for them, I, I think for me as somebody who is, who is a producer, but is also somebody and a producer's job is to amass investors, you know, I had the fiduciary responsibility of being transparent with my investors and say, I don't know if we're going to make a lot of money doing this, but the impact, the return on impact is going to be huge. So, you know, there are some things that you want to invest in that will be a return on investment and you're going to get all your money back. I promise you, because it's going to be a hit on Broadway. It's going to be awesome, which is always a terrible promise to make to any investor, by the way, but it <laughs> sounds better. Sounds better. Uh, but, um, but sometimes I also say to people, listen, I, we're probably not going to make any money on this. I'm going to be really truthful with you. But the return on impact, the generations of theater artists that are going to learn something from this, the opportunities you're going to give these dancers who don't get to express their stories, the, the, the platform that you're going to be giving them, this is going to be truly meaningful and you're going to be really happy you're a part of it. That, that was enough for all of our investors to say yes. That was enough for all of our collaborators to say yes, for people to cut us a deal on room rentals or equipment or whatever that was. And frankly, all it takes is somebody to ask and somebody to, put, again, organize and put it together and not be afraid to ask. So I would say that means anybody can be a producer, right? So don't think that you, you need... You need to have done this before. Don't think that you don't think that you need to have a Tony Award on your shelf. That's you know for best musical or best play of the year. Like you don't need any of that. You you just need a passion for the project, and you need to be able to pick up the phone and and ask. Right, Aaron. Yeah, I will echo that one hundred percent. Because a, I am 
like you like I said, I am a one or two on this scale. I have no business, no place to be advising anyone on doing any of this. That said, it's starting with asking is a great place to begin everywhere. If this, like, I remember when we, when we lost our funding or we lost our producer and Mo and I were like, is this done? Is this dead? Like, is this dead in the water? Do we just do it? And I'm like, let me, give me a day. Let me call Telly. Cause I know he like might have some, some advice for us to see how we could get this off the ground. Like not, not even in a way of like, Hey, can you help us fund any of this? I wasn't pitching anything. I would just like, Hey, this is the project that I have. I know you like, do this so what can you tell me to help me do this because i don't know what i'm doing at all and i think that's it and and again our relationship goes back 20 plus years like i we didn't become friends because i knew, i had this like vision that 20 years later telly would become a producer that i'd be able to like hit up for money later it would no we we all had our relationships and our friendships and as we evolved as artists, being able to remember that like everybody changes and all of those, and not to say that like have your friendships as resources, but like when those opportunities arise, look at your friends and be like, hey, you know something that I don't, let me ask you to help me. And having that kind of humility is sort of the first step in anything. Absolutely. It's, you know, the idea that you don't have to know it all. No, you, know, like you have friends for a reason there, you know, you support each other and, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like being in the arts that just like hyper, it, it's hyper, you know, focused on because that's what the arts is. It's collaboration, you know, it's collaboration and it's respect. And so I think, you know, as a producer, you, you do have to open your mind to say, okay, what do I know? And what don't I know? And, you know, mm -hmm. am I not too proud to call, somebody and yeah. say, Hey, you know more about this than I do. Like, tell me how to well, do and this. I, and I also think that like, I don't know, the, again, you, you two tell me if I'm completely wrong, but, but like, I feel like the outward sort of image that non-producers have of producers is that there's a lot of like chest puffing happening and you need to know everything in order to get in the club. And so, but I feel like when you actually talk to actual producers, that is 100% not true. We don't know that because we don't ask because we think that they're unapproachable or the, or the industry is like in, what is it? What's the word when you can't get into something? When uh, like glass ceiling or barrier or. Yeah. Something gate, like, gate like, kept, like, gatekeeper. yeah, it's, it, 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 it's yeah. that word impenetrable. That's the word I'm thinking ah. of where it's impenetrable and you can't, and whereas if I've learned anything in this, in this experience is that that's 100% not true. And everyone is, because not everyone depends on who you're asking, but more often than not, people will give you the answers you seek. If you're ready to just, ask, if you're willing to just ask. And, you know, I, I also will say this, that you, you bring to, you bring people together that trust, like Aaron said, has been earned over 20 years. It's also not lost on me that the two shows that Aaron and I have worked on have been predominantly Asian shows. So mm. because this podcast is called Producing While Asian, I think already like Aaron and I have a have a not only a history together, but we have a shared common experience of what it means to be Asian in this industry. We yes. know how difficult it is to to wear the actor hat. We also are aware that there are not very many producer hats at all being worn by Asian people. Definitely not a lot of Asian people behind the table on production teams as far as being mm -hmm. directors, choreographers, designers. And I think I think as Broadway moves forward, as ev entertainment, as everything moves forward, we are looking for those opportunities to help lift those people that have not had a seat at the table for a long time. And Absolutely. so for sure, Aaron and I, having worked on two wonderful a Asian musicals, together, you know, uh, and anybody will tell you that if you've worked on those shows, it is a tight knit group of people and it's a tight mm -hmm. bond. Be and I think part of that is because there aren't that m as many opportunities for us as there are for our Caucasian counterparts. There just aren't. Yeah. That's just math, right. right? So when we do get to do it, boy, do we have a good time doing it. And boy, do we form a tight sense of trust 
with one another because of our shared experience, because of our shared experience, not just the joy of getting to do it, but the also the disappointments of not getting to do it as often as our mm -hmm. yeah. Caucasian counterparts, right? So I think I think this, for me, I'm excited. I'm excited that this is Aaron's first producing thing, and I hope he does it more because we need more Asian producers. Yeah, and you know, I, I, the advice that I give younger people is is that same thing. Like, don't be afraid to ask because what's the worst that can happen? Someone says no. You know, before, don't prejudge your question. Just just ask the question because you don't know where it'll lead. You know, and similar to your experience, like I, I've produced like, cabarets and concerts and all that and musical theater theater but my kind of Aaron experience was producing a feature film for the first time a couple years ago and I, I asked to be an associate producer because I was like I don't know how to produce a feature length film and it was the same experience that you're talking about Telly with like it was a film called The Girl Who Left Home and it was all Filipino musical feature length movie and we all just like lived it up because we'd never been or surrounded by all Filipino artists and production team and all that before, because that rarely happens, you know, and to work with people like Paolo Montalban and Emmy Colgado, like just was, you know, rare, like, and, and so I think we all, once you ask the question and you, and you get to be part of that, then you, you hold on and you cherish it forever because we're, we're trying to create those opportunities and show up for the next folks, you know, so that there are no gatekeepers. There's no so-called bamboo ceiling for us. And, you know, we won't have things like an actress playing an anime character who's not Asian. We don't have to mention who she is. But so given all that, oh, I, I think, appreciate you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say one more thing, just in terms of if there was any sort of just spitballing off this conversation, if there were any advice that I would give, given my meager experience, start with something that you care about you you're very very incredibly passionate about because i remember there was my for, first foray into this is something that i really care about and i remember the first time lol this is a thing where i remember telly and joey being on a call with one of our investors where they had me pitch it for the first time and i remember and I didn't know that I was pitching. I was just talking about the thing because I loved it. And I, it was my idea and I hadn't, I enjoyed it. And then like, apparently it worked and we got some money. And after the call, both Joey and Telly were like, it was really wonderful watching you pitch. And I was like, oh, that was pitching. Oh, cool. <laughs> Whereas if that's a thing that you're not doing, if that's a thing that you're doing for something you're not passionate about, but you're just there to like to try to make the money. I can only imagine that is a much harder sell because passion is on you can, is is my gosh is you can't fake passion and you can't monet and you can't monetize it either I don't think mm -hmm. no. you really can't and producing producing is a gamble most of the time yeah because you don't know what the response will be like you can you and your team can be as passionate as you want you know but it really depends on but we are we are in a subjective industry. It's dependent upon other people's opinions and what you know the collective thinks about it. So, you know, you really, like you said, you have to be super passionate. You have to go in it not leading with "I'm going to make money." Yeah. You know, even if you know you will or or whatever, but like you you have to go with that idea of like I'm here for the project, and I'm secondarily here for any whatever financial gain might come from this. So, because that's how you find like the right people and the right project and and all that. So. Thank you both for making the time today to talk about Ensemble. I loved the documentary. I definitely have been telling people about it. So before we go, tell us how people can see this film and where it'll be and all of that good stuff. It will be available on March 11th on Broadway On Demand. There will also be a nice additional piece that's going to be added on to this as well. So not only will you be able to watch the film, but our wonderful friend at Broadway On Demand, Laura Haywood, she is going to do an interview that's going to follow up with all of our, with some of several of our ensemble members to sort of see where they are after the film. So, you know, after a year after the year after the year, where are some <laughs> of these dancers now? And so that's really interesting. So there's a little additional piece as well that we, that we're calling Ensemble in Conversation. But I'm very excited about it. March 11th is the date. It'll be available on on, uh, uh, on Broadway On Demand. And if you want to follow us on Instagram, it's Ensemble Film Official. Awesome. Aaron, any last words before we call it a interview? 
Nah, Telly covered it perfectly. It's like he's done this before. I know, right? It's like he's a producer or something. So thank you again, both. And uh, you're both welcome to come back anytime to talk about anything in the future. And, you know, we definitely would love to chat with you again. Thanks for having us, Don. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Producing While Asian podcast. Our theme song was created by Luxstock. We're produced by Press Play Podcasts, and the show is edited by Michael Santos Sandoval. If you have a moment, please leave a rating and a review and send any ideas you have to producingwhileasian at gmail.com. To follow us, stay updated, or to read our blog, visit www.producingwhileasian.com.